It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to see a lot of uh, faces I became familiar with in the European Parliament. And again, it's a, a big honor for me to be here. Uh, as a minister, you get used to changing things all the time. And uh, that's why I want to inform you before starting my uh, uh, lecture that at the last minute we thought it might be more interesting for this group to have a discussion or to have a lecture on the euro and the euro in its present form and what uh, is happening to this uh, vehicle, if I may put it this way. Here is standing somebody who, as probably some of you know, published in, 19, no, in 2012 a book with the title The End of the Euro. And you can imagine that uh, when I entered for the first time in October last year the Euro group meetings, that some of my uh, colleagues were rather interested in uh, what was exactly in that book. As a matter of fact, I found out that some of them even read the book, which of course always helps the discussion. Uh, so I was very glad to explain to them that uh, I was still standing by what I wrote in that book, uh, like I said, published in the early spring of 2012. Because the title of the book, The End of the Euro, was actually the result of the two basic scenarios that I thought at that time would one of the two scenarios uh, would be inevitable for the longer run of the euro. The first scenario, just remember, we're talking spring, early spring 2012, was that policymakers involved in what at that point was a very severe crisis for the Eurozone would keep on overall putting their head in the sand in terms of recognizing the real issues of that uh, Euro crisis. Too many people at that point in time were still saying this is not really a Euro crisis, this is a crisis because some countries, Greece, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, have had very bad policies. And so if that continued, that was my first scenario, then we would have had really the end of the euro. And I think by now, if I see what uh, people like uh, Mr. Draghi, for example, or other uh, policy people closely involved in what was happening at that point in time or have been saying since then, was a correct conclusion. We had, we had been very close to, indeed, the end of the Euro uh, early 2012. The second scenario was that people would start realizing that, I mean the policymakers involved, that indeed there was much more going on than a few countries pursuing bad policies. And that indeed there was a kind of institutional crisis that this currency union was not well built from the beginning. And that meant, if that recognition would come, that we had to rebuild the monetary union and that we would also have the end of the euro as we knew it at that point in time, because then we would, of course, we would keep the same coins and, uh, and, and the same notes, but the total infrastructure of the euro would change dramatically. And as a matter of fact, I think that we are now in the process of trying to achieve that. And in my sentence, please stress the word trying to change the institutional infrastructure of the eurozone in such a way that uh, indeed it might eventually become uh, something that is, uh, that will uh, live on and will even maybe a contribution to what uh, to our economic uh, environment. Now I think to understand all these issues involved we have to go back a little bit uh, back in history. 
we all know that the uh, monetary union came about in the, or the, uh, the final, final idea about it came about in the early 90s, not least, not least because of what was happening in Europe, the demise of the Soviet Union, and certainly also German unification. We built a structure that was highly asymmetrical from the beginning. We Europeanized monetary union, monetary policy, but we kept economic policy and, budget and fiscal policy nationally. That's something asymmetric. And I take the liberty to stress that very much because I did do that already, I come back to that later, in the 90s. If you create that kind of asymmetric situation, you create a situation where the incentives to change bad policies are very much diminished because the fallout of those bad policies is at least partially also coming, let's say, on the back of all the others in the monetary union. And so that asymmetry has been haunting us actually since then continuously. Now, of course, at the start of the monetary union, there was realization that this kind of asymmetry was not good, but the political landscape did not allow to take the measures necessary to really go to the bottom of this problem, which of course would have meant loss of sovereignty for all the countries involved, or a higher degree of loss of sovereignty than was realized at the start of the monetary union. So, Basically, three things were done to try to deal with that situation, to try to manage the situation. First of all, there was a ban on the monetary financing of governments. Secondly, there was, very important, the no bailout clause. The no bailout clause which should have made it clear that no member state could be liable for uh, the debt of other member states. And thirdly, there were the debt and deficit rules, which were designed to prevent member states from accumulating excessive debt. Two things were also very much present at the birth of the monetary union. And I think I can give the first of those elements just by throwing a quote at you from uh, the then German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who in uh, late 91, November 91, said, the idea, I quote Kohl, the idea of sustaining economic and monetary union over time without politi political union is a fallacy. So the very outspoken vision of one of the creators, I think I may say that, uh, of the monetary union as we know it today, recognized that inevitably, inevitably we would have to go in the direction of monetary, of a political union. And a second element that was very much present in those days was what I call the Monet philosophy. Jean Monnet, one of the founders of the European Union, who played from the beginning what some have called since then the functionalist card, Europe progresses to crises, which means that you need a crisis to Yeah, it's, uh, the light is on again, so you can hear me again. I, I hope it wasn't off already a long time, no? <laughs> I hear the difference now, too. <laughs> so, Monet, Monet's argument was, you need a crisis to get action, and that's a good thing, because action is only leading to steps forward in terms of European integration. Nobody will take or dare to take steps backward. And let me inject here a personal note. 
uh, I, remember, I still remember vividly in the late 90s uh, when the late Jean-Luc de Haane was Prime Minister of Belgium and uh, that was one of my episodes in journalism. And I was writing these things about the monetary union, watch out, we're going to have trouble with this vehicle. And as it happened, the chef de cabinet uh, of Mr. de Haane was the promoter, the former promoter of my PhD. And on one blue mor Monday morning, as they say in Belgium, I got a phone call from him and said, Johan, come over to the prime minister's office and e explain to him about the problems on the horizon with the euro. Mr. De Haane was known for his straightforward way, so I, you can imagine that I was a little bit nervous to just pop in and say, hi, Mr. De Haane, I'm going to explain to you why you're doing something stupid. Uh, so I went there a little bit nervous, but as a matter of fact, he let me speak for at least 20 minutes. And so, optimal currency area theory and things like that, I put it all on the table. And all of a sudden he interrupted me and said, well, probably you're right. And this guy, which of course was his chef de cabinet, my former professor, is telling me exactly the same things as you are. But you know, what you guys don't realize is that that's not the way Europe works. You're probably right. We'll have a crisis and maybe we'll have a few crises. But when these crises arrive, we solve them. And now we go further. And that, of course, was the end of the discussion, because if that is your point of view, that you literally almost say, we need those crises. And when they arrive, then we'll put everything on the table. We'll go to a chateau in France or uh, somewhere, somewhere else. We'll be together for a week. And that's it. Problem solved. The train goes on. I'm not going to comment further on that uh, meeting because it uh, has become, I think, uh, quite obvious uh, that uh, although, let's admit it, a few crises in the past within the European context have indeed been solved, uh, a solution to this one uh, has been uh, somewhat more difficult, let me put it that way. I think it's fair to say that from the discussions that have been going on, that moving forward to a political union in the way that would be sufficient to have the positive impact of that on the monetary union is not really on the table and you're correct if you interpret that as an understatement. But we have the monetary union <clears throat> and we should be able we should be able to manage it better than we have been doing until now. That means that one way or the other, in the short and medium term, we will have to live with the asymmetry that I've been referring to in the beginning of my talk. Monetary policy, is developed at the European level, economic and fiscal policy is still to a very large extent played out at the national level. But what we need to do there in order to survive that period is that we certainly have to rebalance, rebalance control and liability. For me, the the lesson from the Greek experience is that invoking independence while receiving assistance, invoking independence while receiving substantial amounts of financial assistance only leads to political tensions and a lot of very detrimental economic uncertainty. I can rephrase the situation or the issue, the heart of the issue, according to me, uh, still in another way. We need to resolve the tension between solidarity and sovereignty. I think that's the basic challenge of 
where this monetary union stands for today. And if we are not able to deal with it in a better way than uh, we have been doing, let's say, in the past uh, six, seven years, uh, it will, of course, be a very difficult road to uh, stay on uh, for the future. I think there are excellent ideas in the by now famous Five Presidents report on the way forward with the monetary union, but this particular issue, the unbalance between solidarity and sovereignty, between control and liability, is what I find missing in this report. There are not enough substantial or substantive uh, references to it or uh, uh, specific recommendations on how we're going to solve that and how we uh, can uh, make it better. So if the point is that we need to find ways to deal better with the decentralized decision-making that is still very characteristic for fiscal and uh, economic policies, what we will have to do is to have better rules on which stricter control has to be possible. Of course, by now, and I think that's uh, undoubtedly a major advantage when you look at it from the point of view of the monetary union, we have the banking union with a single supervisory mechanism with the single resolution mechanism. And I think if this monetary union goes further, you need this kind of banking union with this kind of supervision for your systemic banks. I think, honestly, that a lot of ground has been covered. Our, the banks are much better uh, capitalized, and in terms of what happens uh, when one of these systemic banks would become uh, or would come under pressure, I think we've also made enormous progress. There is certainly no longer an immediate return to the taxpayer, but of course, as you all know, the bankers' uh, capitals have been, are much larger now and uh, the creditors would be called for uh, in any way, first of all, in terms of a problem. Now, there is still ground to cover for the banking union uh, in terms of giving it uh, the, the supervisory mechanisms and the resolution mechanisms to give it, let's say, sufficient financial firepower. And there, of course, the same problem pops up again. Moral hazard, if you do this in a way that is not sufficiently thought through. And that's why I think that, for example, and you all know that the discussion is going on now at the European level, that in terms of the fiscal backstop, nobody can deny that once you create a banking union, there has to be somewhere a fiscal backstop. Otherwise, it's not credible. But there are, of course, several ways in which you can organize that fiscal backstop. The discussion is still open, and I think for me as an economist uh, and also for my government, it's very important that the way in which we come to that fiscal backstop, and I repeat, it's inevitable that there is a fiscal backstop, that it has to be built up in such a way that moral hazard, moral hazard is minimalized. You cannot exclude it probably entirely, but I think there are some schemes floating around now where moral hazard is all over the place and I don't really think that we should do that. We should go for mechanisms that limit this moral hazard issue uh, as far as possible. So in terms of what needs to be done in order to be able to deal with the asymmetric situation that is still typical of the monetary union, I think the banking union as a first uh, step has been quite important and uh, it is not 
uh, a done deal in the sense of that the banking union is now a full-grown child. No, there is still ground to cover in order to uh, have a real banking union and you can't have a real monetary union without a real banking union, as certainly as far as the systemic banks within your um, monetary union is concerned. A second element is fiscal rules and debt rules. Obviously, the way in which these rules were respected or not respected has been not good. We have not been able to uh, live by the rules that in the kind of monetary union that we have, we need to follow. I mean the rules that we need to follow. So, does that mean that these rules are like put in concrete and inviolable? To some extent, yes. And of course this brings immediately the discussion on, for example, what we see now with the, the refugee crisis and of course with the latest development in terms of the terrorism threat that is very much present, let's say, for the whole of Europe. I think we need to recognize that the costs involved in those very important situations, these crises, let's call it what it is, are important and huge. But they cannot be an excuse to throw budgetary discipline out of the door. It's a question of, I think, I'm convinced of the priorities of the governments. I think we can no longer deny that the terrorist issue is a major issue and that there are clear signs for some countries more than for others. That's uh, still a little bit an open question that we need to reinvest in order to get to an infrastructure that gives better protection to our citizens in terms of these threats, which, as we have seen in Paris once again, are very real and very frightful. But I don't think we can take the argument that far that we say, well, the hell with budgetary discipline, let's spend our way out of this security crisis, if you want to put that definition on it. Uh, and see where we end up with the deficits and the debt in two or three or five year time. I don't think that would be a sensible road to take. Debt levels are overall, and certainly also in my country, already at a quite high level. We don't, we really, what, whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, we have to take these elements into consideration when we are talking about policies with respect to refugees and with respect to terrorism. And so I repeat, it's a question of priorities and acting according to the priorities you lay out on the table. The banking union, the fiscal and debt rules need to be more respected. And then there is, of course, the whole procedure or the procedures in plural that have been worked out in order to identify macro imbalances uh, at an earlier stage than used to be the case. There are certainly very good ideas around, but what is more and more striking for me, if you are then part, become part of the discussions on those issues with the European Commission, that it is less clear than you thought it was. To put it in another way, there's a lot of black box economics in it, or I better say black box, black box things. I think, and I'm not the first to call on the European Commission on those issues, let's be much more clearer about what we want to achieve, which objectives are put on the table, what numbers are put on the, on the objectives, and how we define our parameters. It is, and I fear a little bit increasingly, unclear, or too much unclear what the Commission wants to achieve on a number of issues that are always on the table when you're talking about macroeconomic imbalances. So 
Nobody is uh, much uh, helped with having discussions where on the one side of the table you think it's X plus one and the other side of the table thinks it's my, it's uh, Y minus one. So I think we're very much in need of much clearer communication, much more specific discussions on issues that have been defined in the proper way by uh, the European Commission, of course, in the process of the normal political decision making that should take place. I've given you my thoughts on the euro. The short-term and mid-term perspective of trying to deal with the basic asymmetry that has been in the system since the beginning and that we, uh, according to what I see happening on the political scene, will not be able to resolve at short term, will remain the main challenge for everybody who is involved in discussions at the policy level at the European level. Thank you very much.